Listo. Ahora sí, ahí va. Ok, buenos días. Por parte de la Universidad Autónoma de Chihuahua y la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras, les damos la más cordial bienvenida a todas y todos ustedes a la cuadragésima tercera semana del humanismo, ética y educación como herramientas contra la brecha social. Agradecemos la presencia de la comunidad de la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras de la UASH, además al público que nos sigue por nuestras redes sociales oficiales, por las cuales estamos transmitiendo en vivo esta semana del humanismo. Antes de iniciar con la presentación de nuestros conferencistas, queremos solicitarle a quienes tengan preguntas, las compartan en el chat para ser leídas al finalizar la conferencia. Gracias. Este día nos da gusto recibir al licenciado José Luis Valdez Chávez. El maestro José Luis Valdez Chávez, egresado de la licenciatura en lengua inglesa, actualmente docente en nuestra facultad, así como instructor en el programa English Access Micro Scholarship Program de la Embajada de los Estados Unidos en México desde el año 2015, cuyo propósito es trabajar con jóvenes que se encuentran en algún tipo de riesgo social. En esta ocasión también contamos con la participación de Rebeca Licea Bundes, egresada de la segunda generación de English Access Micro Scholarship Program y actualmente el Access Program for Alumni. Y Axa Tamara Bentarcourt, también egresada de la primera generación del English Access Micro Scholarship Program y actualmente cursa el séptimo semestre de la carrera en lengua inglesa. Ahora bien, ellos nos presentarán la mesa The Importance of Educational Programs to Support Students in Social Risk. Adelante, por favor. Thank you very much, Diana. And thank you very much, everyone who's listening to this talk. Well, my name is Jose Luis Valdez. I'm really happy to be with, here, uh, with you here today. So we're going to talk about the importance of educational programs to support students in social risk. So let's start first with some definition about educational programs. What are we talking about? So next, Aksa, thank you. When we talk about uh, educational programs, we can talk about school in general. It could be the program that you have in elementary school, middle school, high school, etc. University for you, my dear students. And in this case, we're going to be talking specifically about those programs or those projects that try to have extracurricular activities and are going to be beneficial or helpful for students or public in general. In this case, we're talking about these programs that can help us with different areas. It could be for languages, it could be for arts, it could be for science, for maths, for anything, anything in which you can learn something valuable. The point of the, these educational programs is to have some kind of retribution or give something back to the community. That's why we have many examples in Chihuahua the country, the world in general. But the point is that an educational program is, the goal is to help society. The goal is to help students from different ages and try to develop different skills. Next example, please. When we refer to social risk, we can have different definitions depending on the domain or depending on the area that we're talking about. A social risk can represent um, an event that puts or uh, gets you in risk of something. We can uh, analyze from different perspectives, for, for example, sociology, geography, uh, psychology, law, also uh, social security, economy, public policies, etc. In this case, when we talk about social risk, we're talking about situations of vulner vulnerability of a population population group. So it means that there is something, there is an issue or there could be a problem in, in a certain group and the educational programs are going to try to help those communities with different activities, with different events. And the point is to try to eliminate the negative side and try to focus only on the positive. In this case, when we talk about social risk in Chihuahua, what do you imagine? Just giving you time to think about it. Maybe when we talk about social risk, we may think about, I don't know, 
problems uh, in general with wars, or maybe when we have problems with the socioeconomic status, for example. In particularly, here in Chihuahua, we face two main situations. That is going to be the socioeconomic status, and it's going to be violence. Unfortunately, you're, you're familiar to these kind of terms because it's something that we see every day in the news. It's a problem that we constantly have in Mexico, but more specifically in our community in Chihuahua. That's why there are many alternatives that can help us to keep youth, keep children, keep students at school, or at least doing some kind of activities that are going to be related to education. But at the same time, they are learning through values. The objectives of educational programs is to keep students doing something good, doing something positive. You know that out there, many things are happening nowadays. Some of them are good, of course, but many of them are bad. The point or the objective for you as students or you as a teacher is to try to keep those students or keep public in general in the positive, with the good things, with the good actions. One of those problems, or well, as I mentioned before, the socioeconomic status and violence are common here in Chihuahua. And for, the, for those reasons, there are many educational programs that can help our community. Some of examples are the following. Axa, please. Okay, there are many examples in Chihuahua. I have just here a few of them. We have, for example, Access, English Access Micro Scholarship Program. That is one that is present in our university, specifically in our school, Facultad de Filosofía y Letras. But there are many others. Maybe you can identify some of these examples. The leader, for example, we can have a uh, one that it's a very common program or popular program here in Chihuahua because they offer music and art classes to children different ages. We have um, Jóvenes en Acción. That is another program that tries to develop leadership skills, try to develop uh, some kind of connection between youth in Mexico and their communities. We also have the open program that is the online professional English network. There are many options that are kind of in a group, for example, Access, Jóvenes en Acción, Online Professional English Network. They work together in the Arello office here in Mexico. At the end of this talk, I will give you a link in which you can find extra information and in what they, in, where, in which you can find the descriptions. The open program helps you, specifically language students, to develop your teaching skills, or actually not, your, or not only your teaching skills, but your professional English skills. We have some other options, for example, at the Program de Safio, or as I mentioned before, the CE leader, in which they are trying to develop some leadership skills in, in Spanish in this case, and they're trying to motivate students to keep studying, to keep with the good work, to start doing something for their, themselves, their families, but also for their society. So this is not only learning something like, or going to school again, or having extra classes. This is developing your skills in different areas. Later on, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what Access is, and AXA and Rebecca are going to tell us a little bit about their experiences. But let's go step by step. Next, AXA, please. As you may know, it is important to talk about this uh, elements about the educational programs because they are going to have benefits not only for the student like in the academic life but also in their professional life and also personal life. Next. Well, first of all, we know that education is important for everyone and it's not only for students. Education nowadays is necessary and it's important and it's also a right. So it's a right that will develop people's well-being. Maybe when you were checking the program of Semana del Humanismo, you could see or you could identify these little um, colored squares with different names. And you were thinking, what is the function or what, does, what do those uh, squares represent? Well, those little squares with, with um, different colors and different numbers are actually very big projects all around the world. 
They are the sustainable development goals for education in, in different areas. And they are proposed by the United Nations. There is um, a project, a global project that is called uh, Agenda 2030 or Agenda 2030, yes. in which the objective is that by that year, by the year 2030 or 2030, many things are, are supposed to be different. Many countries, around 190 something countries, develop this agenda in order to fight and try to achieve these goals. As you can see in this presentation, the objectives are very simple in terms of naming them, but they convey a lot of work. By that year, uh, the world is trying to eliminate poverty, zero hunger, good health and well being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanit sanitation, yes, and some others. You can check them here in the presentation or you can investigate a little bit later. I invite you to look. I invite you to check those goals because it's, um, it's an ambitious program or it's an ambitious project that many countries are looking for. And as you can see, our university is trying to achieve those goals as well. We're trying to make our contribution. That's why uh, talks like this one or events like Semana del Humanismo are important because they are going to help the efforts to achieve these goals. The point is to try to improve people's lives and, of course, doing it with sustainable um, manners or ways of doing it. Now, let's continue, please, Saksam. Let's talk a little bit about figures or some numbers. This data is from uh, 2014. It has changed a little bit by now, but it's still relevant. It says that by the end of 2014 or 2014, 263 million children and youth, it means students and or young learners and young adults, uh, were not at school. They were not in school. They were not studying. So you can see that is uh, impressive. It's surprisingly sad the number of people that are out of school, especially children and youth. From those uh, 263 uh, million, 61 represent students or children uh, between the ages six to 11 years old. Another 60 is between 12 and 14 years old. And the rest, more than 142 million represent 15 or older. And as you can assume, most of these students are girls, yes, or young women. So there are many things that we still have to work for. And the ones who have the opportunity, this is us, the ones who we have the opportunity to go to school, to learn, to practice, to, I don't know, just to be at school, it's necessary to take advantage of those opportunities because sometimes we don't do it. We go to school, we want to get a degree, we want to finish because we want to start working or something, but you need to stop. You need to make an analysis and check what you need and what you have to do because education is a right, but also it's a responsibility. In many countries all around the world, access to education has improved, but this doesn't mean uh, that education or learning has improved. So we have more people at school now, but according to um, the UNESCO, for example, uh, a, a lot of people, they don't see, they still have problems to read, to learn, to, to read, to write, and to do basic maths. So this is not just going to school but actually taking, taking advantage of it. And we're talking about school, but also, as I mentioned before, the educational programs, particularly those special projects that are developed by the governments, by private institutions, try to complement uh, to what happened at school. Maybe you have your regular classes, you finish at a certain hour, 
but you can see that many people are trying to get a little bit more. That's why they go to, I don't know, language classes. They maybe go to a sports institution. They're trying to learn different skills, right, to develop technical areas. So the point here is to try to complement your skills. And this is going to be um, beneficial for you in your academic life, your professional life, but also your personal life, because we're trying to have happier people. The rector de la, el rector de la universidad once said that the function, not the objective of education is to have happy citizens. But in order to achieve that goal, well, you need to study, you need to make an effort, you need to work, you need to achieve your goals so you can find that satisfaction. Well, let's continue. Thank you, Elsa. Here I have some of the benefits of having these um, educational programs or these specific educational programs. Not exactly about school uh, itself, but these extra programs or these extracurricular activities that can help you with different areas. Of course, they are going to offer more opportunities for students. We know, or language, language students know, that we have different learning styles. We also have the theory of different or multiple intelligences. So sometimes one institution or one program is not exactly the one that I need, the one that you need, the one that she or he needs. So there are many opportunities. There are different options that you can take. So this is going to lead, of course, to student success. If you're prepared, if you like what you're doing, if you're having fun while you're doing it, of course, you're going to be, it's more probable for you to finish it. It's more likely that you're going to have success. And it, it's not restricted to any group. It could be children, it could be teenagers, it could be adults, it could be any person who is actually trying to uh, improve their, themselves. Well, also for institutions and also as teachers, we're trying to look for the students' retention. So we don't want students to drop out of school. Nowadays, you can see that due to the pandemic, we have faced many difficult situations. And one of those is that students or some students that can't or don't want to continue at school because maybe the lack of access, the lack of resources, maybe because it's not what they were looking for, maybe because it's getting uh, a little bit boring now that it, everything is in front of a screen. Even uh, maybe if you are in your cell phone and it's a sm small screen, okay, maybe you're going to feel restrained, frustrated, but these kind of programs and also with good training, it's going to um, be a better option to retain those students. Also, we want to have more students in all schools, in all programs. Why? Because we want to provide people in general those tools they need to succeed in life. And of course, if we have education, the tendency is that we're going to have employment. So if we have training, if we have people who are prepared, of course, we're going to demand for those, uh, for those jobs that require the skills that we have acquired. So the point is to uh, improve the employment in the region, but this is going to be also a work that involves different sections, different parts. So we need students and teachers to take their responsibility and also institutions. So it's school, schools or the responsible of the programs, also the government. So it's a little bit of everything in which we can create the opportunities for a school and for a good work or a good job. And of course, enhance regional economic development. Yes, we want to have students to learn, to have fun, but at the end of the day, we want them to be able to survive in this society, to survive in this world. Many things are changing and you can see that many things are very challenging. I don't want to say difficult, that's a little bit different, but they, things are getting challenging a little bit more and more and more. So you need to be prepared and you need to have the opportunities to, to be able to have your family, to be able to have your uh, things that cause you pleasure. So you need to be prepared and ask for those things, ask for those opportunities. 
So these are some of the benefits. Now, can we continue, Axel? Let me tell you now a little bit, and this is a little bit more specific about the English Access Micro Scholarship Program that is actually provided here in our university. This is a program that can be found all around the globe. Yes, it's in different countries or in many, many countries. Here in Mexico, it started around 10 years ago, if I'm not wrong. And you can find this program in those states or those cities that, as I previously mentioned, have some kind of social risk, maybe because the socioeconomic status, maybe because of the problems that they have um, with violence or, any, or some other factors. For example, they don't have access to education because they live in very remote or far away areas. So access to education in English in this case or through technology is difficult or even impossible. But programs like this one try to give that opportunity to those talented students that uh, apply and are selected. In this case, the program started in 2015 in Chihuahua because we were suffering, we still are, right? But we were living in these um, violent times and we needed to have more programs that involve, that hug the students so they could continue doing good things because it's easier to make a bad decision and to go with bad people. So the point is to have them with us, to do something positive, to do something good. This program that I'm going to be referring as access only, offers um, a language course. So the point is that our students learn English, but not only English. They are supposed to do it through values since they are going to develop different skills. One of them is going to be leadership. Another one is going to be um, social skills. Another one is going to be science and technology. So the point is that they are going to have different types of activities in order to acquire the language and also the culture. As you know, when you're teaching a language, any language, you're not only teaching vocabulary or grammar structures, but also the culture. So you need to try to involve those students in order to acquire it faster because this program uh, lasts two years and the students are supposed to uh, go from A1, that is basic beginners, up to B2 or B1. Yes. Actually, we have had some very good results and obtained uh, C1 that in in general terms is advanced. It's a bilingual person. Well, in Chihuahua, we have had two generations of this access program in one extra that is for access alumni, that it was a result of the pandemic. So the, the, the pandemic has like a positive or a, a good um, consequence. That is the creation of this alternative, this access alumni program that offers those alumni that want to continue with their skills. And it's one extra year of English and technology classes. The classes are offered at Diplomado Inglés here at our school and also in, in our school, Facultad de Filosofía y Letras. Maybe some of you have, have seen them, um, o cuando íbamos a los salones, maybe you, you saw your um, access students um, taking classes in, in some classrooms or at the cafeteria or doing some activities outside because we have activities in the classroom, outside the classroom, in different places of Chihuahua. So, it's not only in the classroom activities. However, I'm going to show you now some pictures and tell you a little bit of what we have done. And this is not only for access, this can work with any program. There are many opportunities offered by the government or by uh, the embassies, not only the American one, but some other embassies or institutions are encouraged or we encourage institutions to develop their own programs. Of course, resources are necessary, but sometimes something that is more important than money is um, the motivation to do it. So let's continue with the next one, Axa, please. Okay, there are many things that we have done in, in Access. 
for example, the scheme of Benjamin Franklin, where our students can go to the library so they can practice use their tools. Of course, we have sessions in the classroom. We try to have experiments in the classroom, outside the classroom with different subjects. We have a lot of talks with personalities, not personalities, but people from uh, different institutions, different institutions. We have, or we have tried to include music a lot, as I told him. Technology, science is always there. Of course, the government of Chihuahua and from university are involved. We try to have sports. We try to invite people from the United States and Mexico to tell us about it. We try to use video games. We try to have uh, different kind of role plays or act all kind of activities that are going to involve our students. We have also participated in the dance event dinner. And of course, we use a lot of video conferences. Actually, we started using video conferences be before they were cool. So back in 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, we have used video conferences with native speakers. So our students have the chance to participate and practice with people all around the world. We have had pimples. So they used to write letters to students from Pakistan, Morocco, um, and Africa in general, Asia in general, Latin America. So we have had a very good networking here. But now before, or actually just for me to stop and let AXA continue with her experience, we're going to move to the next part. So thank you very much. Let's continue now with AXA. You can skip that one, AXA, thank you. Um, good morning, my name is AXA and I was in the first generation of uh, the AXA Explorer. Uh, to begin with, I, I want to say I was 14 back then in, 2015, and um, this program presented to me as an opportunity to start uh, learning English. Uh, but what I didn't know was that it wasn't only, as the teacher said, it wasn't only about learning English, but um, but about uh, developing uh, leader leadership uh, skills and. Um, and yeah, uh, social skills in general. Um, I remember we had uh, these camps in which we were asked to work in teams to um, learn about, uh, for example, we went to the engineering campus uh, of the WASH. Um, we also have um, a camp uh, only focused on literature and, and art and uh, of course, everything was in English. So we learned those things in, from a different perspective. And um, yeah, it was a very enriching experience. Um, it, helped, it helped me a lot to, to start knowing who I was as a person and what my, my preference were. Uh, for example, I decided to continue with this path of, of English and I entered this career, uh, Lingua Inglesa. And um, I think uh, that was the first step for me to take this uh, decision. And I think it was a very good one. So yeah, um, overall, that's my experience. And uh, as you could see in, in the pictures, I was in, in one of them, in most of them. Uh, we had the Thanksgiving uh, event. We made a play of the of what Thanksgiving um, is. We had music and, and a dinner, and we had uh, we had uh, uh, video conferences with the American embassy. We had people to from America to to talk with and. Um, yeah, it, it was a really good experience um, in general. Um, in one of the camps, uh, I was uh, prized with a um, diploma or a certificate for, for being enthousi enthusiastic. And I, 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 it's one of the experiences I, I must recall because it was so cool to have a diploma for being enthusiastic. And so, yeah, this um, not only we learned about um, about English, we, we didn't only learn English, we learned how to be a community. 
And I think that's that's the experience I I recall. And yeah, in this picture, I'm I'm there somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. it for me. <laughs> Thank you, Axel. Well, so this is one of those uh, successful stories because uh, I recall Axel as a student and many other ones, of course. But I remember that Jill was always participating. And one of the objectives of these educational programs is to cook the students, right? To make them continue studying or practicing or learning something. In this case, I remember that I got the chance to see AXA at Bachilleres. I was with my practicum students from Lingua Inglesa, but by any chance, AXA one, was one of those students taking classes at Bachilleres and she was in these um, English classes, especially English classes for uh, Bachilleres. And I never imagined that she would continue studying Lingua Inglesa. And now it's really, amazing that we have students from this program here now at university. And if I'm not wrong, AXA is in now in six or seven semester. Yes. So it, she's almost done. And we can see that is one of those cases in which these programs actually achieve their goals. Now I'm going to continue with Rebecca. Rebecca is part of the second generation and she's now in the program for Access Alumni. So ready when you are, Miss. So hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. So uh, my name is Rebecca, and like teacher said, I am as part of the second generation of Access program. I started Access when I was 14. I was in eighth grade, I think. And I don't know, for me, being part of Access was one of the best decisions uh, I had a lot of experiences. I learned a lot and I met a wonderful people and I made friends with a bunch of them. I mean, because it was hard not to bond with someone because you're surrounded by teenagers your age. So you're always like having fun with them. Uh, for me, uh, in particular, learning English was never something boring. It was always something new, something different. Uh, something that somehow made me stand up from my classmates at school because um, I mean, thanks to access, I, I knew more, a little bit more English than them. Um, and I don't know, it all, it all helped going uh, Saturdays to the Glomado and going for a few hours and all the camps and the talks and talking to the consuls and to the embassy and practicing with uh, people from the States that are native speakers, it'll, it'll help to improve my English from day one to um, I finish the program and I keep improving my English now that I'm in the other out of my program. <laughs> um, I don't know, uh, like the teacher said, access wasn't just all about English. Uh, I mean, of course, its main goal was to teach us how to speak English, but um, I remember like uh, having much deeper activities with like a deeper meaning. Uh, we would have talks about the environment. Uh, in the camps, we would analyze uh, how to make a compost uh, on our house and the little things we could do to slow down the climate change and stuff. We would also have talks with uh, the embassy or people in general about gender equality, what it is and how it's still a problem and how people still suffer for it. Also, we would analyze a little bit of feminism and what it is to be feminist in the 21st century, um, about the vote, uh, why is it important, and stuff like that. Uh, I remember one time we had the chance to go to this like nursing home for elderly women and we had the chance to uh, play with them and be with them and they will tell us a little bit about their story um, and they were these were all this like 
uh, activities and topics that we would analyze that at the end of the day did create an impact on us uh, that made us think. And I like to think, believe that I'm a little bit of a better person because of it. Uh, well, like I said, I never really saw access like this English school. I always like, thought that access bring more to the table than the, just that. Because it was this like key to open more doors uh, full of experiences. I mean, after I finished after this, I got the chance to be part of this sort of conversational club uh, with other access students from different states and from different countries. I got the chance to meet people from Ecuador and from Palestine, and it was amazing seeing the cultural differences we all had. And I don't know, for me, it was something very nice um, the, to see that the thing that bonded us, the thing that made communication possible was English. Because I mean, with Palestine people, I, I didn't know the language and they didn't know ours. So the thing that made us bond, that made us share our experiences was through English. I also got the chance to be part of this uh, course on how to teach English as a second language. And I put in practice while somehow tutoring a girl from Veracruz. She was also part of the, uh, the access program. And I guess that's, that's the point of this program that helped us like somehow open our minds about all the opportunities that are out there that sometimes we didn't know they existed. And I mean, with access, I mean, they give you like this tool that is to speak English and they give you also ideas and tell you about these opportunities and how you can take advantage of this tool and how you can use it for your own benefit. And well, uh, it's up to you if you decide to take advantages of these opportunities. And I mean, that's what I'm trying to do, really. Uh, trying to take in as much as I can and keep improving my English because it's something that I really enjoy. So I guess to conclude, I like to say that access was a beautiful experience. It changed my mind in a better way. And I don't know, I take with me all those experiences, all those memories and all those teachings. And yeah, they somehow they run free in my mind. Uh, yeah, this is, this was part of my generation. Uh, this time we were in the Benjamin Franklin. And I'm actually in this photo. I'm the one with the uniform and like the red and gray uniform. Okay, thank you very much, Rebecca. So as you can see, guys, when we like what we're doing, you can notice, you can notice in access in Rebecca's experiences or words that they enjoyed the program and actually they took advantage of the program. Taking advantage of this picture, you can see there uh, some of the teachers. Actually, in this program, we were uh, for teachers. It was teacher David, that is one in the middle, you can identify it. But then you can see teacher Lorena Jimenez, that is on your left, she's touching her hair, yes. And right in the middle with the green book is teacher Blanquita. And I'm not in that picture. But the, pro, the point here is that these four teachers also are uh, graduated from Lingua Inglesa. So here we are Lingua Inglesa doing something for Lingua Inglesa. And before us, there were other teachers that had some kind of impact on us. For example, one of my English teachers, I mean, for me to learn or to acquire the language was teacher Gabriela Ocon. So thank you very much teacher Gabriela for being my teacher. So now I'm a teacher. So I'm teaching AXA and maybe later Rebecca and then maybe they can continue with another, another generation of students, or maybe not students. Maybe one of your objectives is not exactly to become a teacher, but at the end of the day, the retributions to society can come from different places. 
So maybe you're not going to be a teacher, but you can become an instructor, or maybe you're going to be working in a company or in the government, and then you can create something that is going to help your community in a certain way. One of the objectives of uh, educational programs, access to some others, are that you need to develop a program, develop a project, or some kind of activity that is going to have positive impact in society. You can see, for example, in this case, particularly, Axe and Rebecca planting some trees and cleaning some green areas in the city. We also visited uh, some nursery homes, so we could retribute, we could help our community in a certain way. But once again, not only about access, let's talk about the educational programs in general, the private and the public ones. The objective here is to create good citizens. So they create um, or they make a better society to live in. Now, I'm just going to move forward a little bit to the conclusions. So I encourage you, in case you have questions, to write them in the chat so we can analyze them. Uh, at the end of this talk, that is in a few more minutes. So in our conclusions, next, Axa, please. We can say that educational programs can involve learning, uh, improve, I'm sorry, learning outcomes. Well, when we first had Axa and Rebecca in the classroom, I can tell you that they have none or minimum uh, knowledge of the English language. And now you can see the improvement. Of course, we all can continue learning. Sometimes we have mistakes. I have a lot of mistakes. I make a lot of mistakes. But you can see that, for example, in these two cases, they developed a language in a couple of years. And they're still working on it and other skills. And it's, this is not only for English. This can be for all kinds of skills in different fields or areas. The point is to be engaged and to make, a, make an effort to try to complete, to achieve your goals, to complete the programs, or to offer programs to others. The second point here, some programs are more effective than others. We need to check what is what I want in order to select the best options for me. And when I'm doing it, Maybe I'm not sure about my major, maybe I want to change, or maybe these classes, I'm extra classes I'm taking uh, are not exactly what I was expecting. Okay, make adult decisions. I recommend you to always finish what you start because at the end, sometimes you receive this satisfaction that you never imagined before. So I encourage you, I invite you to complete the programs. I invite you to keep, uh, to keep at school that you take up different activities, that you invite others to start doing different activities, courses, diplomados, etc. <clears throat> As I told you, they are private and public. The third, students face multiple barriers, therefore new programs must be effective and well-organized and designed. Uh, I can tell you, for example, that at the beginning of many programs, it could be once again, public or private, programs, the first one is like, you're checking like what is working, what is not working. And the second one, you say, I know what I have to do. I'm going to do it better. So you start in constant improvement. You start developing and building up. So the point here is to try to design effective programs and to continue with those programs. Because sometimes we have very good ideas, very good projects, national projects, school projects, etc. And then they don't continue next year. And then they continue next year, but with differences. So the point to have some kind of continuity so they can um, actually work. The fourth, OK, programs should be evaluated to know their effectiveness. And this is not to check the teachers or to try to see if the participants are getting or not the points. This is just to uh, know <clears throat> to if the program is working in terms of social impact, positive impact. Sometimes when we have these programs, it could be for languages, it could be for arts, it could be for science, it could be for many things. We believe that they are not successful if at the end, our participants or students or practitioners don't achieve all of the objectives. That is 
actually the main goal, but sometimes it's impossible. You may say, well, this person finished the language course, but he or she has an intermediate level. She's missing, he's missing a lot of things. Yes, but at the same time, she or he develop his social or her social skills. That person is not smoking anymore. That person continues at school. That person didn't do that. That person would do that in the future. So sometimes we don't have, uh, sometimes we don't get exactly what we want, but there is like some impact. Let's try to have a positive one, a positive impact. The fifth, it is possible to learn by having fun and this should be encouraged. We always say that we have, or we need dynamic classes, that we need to have fun, etc. But having fun is not always laughing in the classroom, but doing something because you want to, and while you're doing it, you are enjoying it. You say, ah, lengua inglesa leer mucho. Yes, but if you know how to read, if you identify those elements that you enjoy, and you pay attention, you listen to your teachers, you listen to your students, Okay. You can develop those activities that are going to be um, more effective. They are going to be meaningful in the classroom and outside the classroom. So having fun is not something that, but also we need to find a balance. Yes, We need to find that point in which the activities, the exercises, the projects, the plans that I have combine different things. Uh, they are learning something, I am learning something, I am teaching something, they are teaching something, they are having fun, the institution is helping, the institution is uh, listening. The job opportunities will come later because I have this skill, this skill, and that skill. Remember that maybe in our school we don't have a lot of students, but we have the best students. I have noticed, I have compared with different schools, I have compared with different facultades, and of course, we all have different um, strengths and weaknesses. So let's work on those areas that we need to improve. And finally, uh, many institutions and the government are working on, on the progress, the improvement of society, some more than others, of course, but also we need to do something about it. We, and I, when I say we, it says students, teachers, and institutions. If you're a student, okay, your responsibility is very simple. Your parents have told you all your life, you have to study, you have to pay attention in classes, you have to do something, and that's it. When you finish school, okay, let's face real life. Let's go to the jungle and start doing something positive. Of course, I want to work because I want to earn my money and I want to have my own things, etc but also having some well-being for society is not only me. It's retribute, it's help others so they can uh, go with me, they can improve with me. That's for the students. For the teachers, if there are some teachers over there, I humbly give my opinions about it and it's okay, listen to your students. What is happening now? Things are changing, we have to change. If we have new generations of students, we need to offer different opportunities. We need to look for alternatives. Sometimes it's kind of comfortable to start doing the same thing because it works. And then we stop innovation. We stop developing ideas. We stop designing materials. So let's continue working with them. And the same for the future teachers. You say, okay, I'm going to start working any area and I'm going to do what my teachers did with me. Okay, you can take them as a reference but you need to do something new. You need to do something different because if we continue doing the same things, we're going to continue having the same results. So that's for the teachers. And for the institutions, if someone from the institution is listening to me, <clears throat> I know you're working, but there are many things that can be improved. <clears throat> and well, all of us together need to work in improvement, but also in this, uh, <clears throat> pardon, Sustainable development goals. So by the year 2030, we can be proud that we did our best to achieve those goals. Maybe 
we didn't achieve them all, or maybe we won't do it, maybe we will. But the point is that we need to make an effort now because, well, um, we need to work all together. And as you can see it in my presentation, just to finish, the time to act is now. So I want to thank Rebecca, AXA, all the public in general for being here today. And with this, we finish our presentation. Now, in case you have any questions, please let us know. ¿Dónde podrían encontrar más información del English Access Micro, Micro Scholarship Program? ¿O cómo podemos formar parte de él? Ok. Ah, bueno, lo, lo digo en español para que quede claro para todos. Eh, se abren de repente convocatorias precisamente para, <coughs> para aplicar a estos programas. Por ejemplo, Access, si me ayuda ahí con la lista de referencias, ahí les vamos a, a, le podemos dejar un link que después si quieren podemos compartir por otro lado. La que sigue, Exxon, que es Rello. Ok, es el último, el que no se ve. <ríe> Pero bueno, es US Embassy and Consulates in Mexico, que es la, la encargada, Rilo, R-E-L-O, Rilo, es la Regional, déjame digo cómo es, Regional English Language Office, que es la encargada de todos los programas de, de, de idiomas en principalmente en inglés, aquí en México. Ahí vienen las convocatorias de todos los programas que hay, que puede ser, por ejemplo, Access, puede ser Jóvenes en Acción, puede ser la de Open, hay diferentes opciones. Ahorita, si nos hacen el favor, no sé, Axa o Rebeca, de escribirlo ahí en el chat y que Diana se los pueda poner en el chat también para que sea editable, que lo puedan copiar la, las personas que quieran tener el link. Si no, nos regresamos una Axa, please. Ahí vienen nuestros correos donde les podemos mandar un poquito más de información o los links para estas presentaciones y pues para esta es información. Y la, esta convocatoria mmm, sale cada dos o tres años, en particular la de Access, porque precisamente empezamos con una generación, la terminamos, procesos administrativos al inicio y al final, etcétera, y regularmente hasta el tercer año se abre. Ahorita nosotros terminamos con la segunda generación de Access, que es la de Rebeca, en 2019. Y para el 2020 no estaba programada una generación, pero se abrió este nuevo programa de Access Alumni, que no existía. De hecho, lo empezamos aquí en Chihuahua y se está como que revisando para retomarse a nivel nacional y global. A ver si funciona. Y veamos si para el siguiente año este, se lanza una convocatoria otra vez para Chihuahua. Regularmente esta convocatoria va cambiando en particular de Access, ya que algunos estados entran y salen de esas listas oficiales de, de estados o ciudades en algún tipo de red social. Hay veces que cuando nuestros índices van mejorando, se nos considera que estamos viviendo un poco mejor, así que entran a esa lista otros programas o se les da un poquito más de... Um, de, de ventana a esos, a esos estados, a esas ciudades, que lo necesiten quizá un poquito más que nosotros. Por eso a veces se lanza en Chihuahua, a veces no. Pero pues veamos si a inicios del año que entra se lanza la convocatoria para una tercera convocatoria aquí en Chihuahua. Una tercera generación, perdón. Y en caso de que así sea, créanme que yo se los voy a comunicar. No sé si haya más preguntas. O tiempo para ellos. Pues tiempo, no mucho. Y pues, lamentablemente se nos ha terminado el tiempo para nuestros invitados, que son ustedes tres, José Luis Valdés, Axa Betancourt y Rebeca Licea. Y agradecemos a ustedes la confianza puesta en la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras de la UASH para presentarnos su trabajo y experiencias. Y en este sentido, me permito leer la constancia que emite la Universidad Autónoma de Chihuahua. ¿Creen que la puedan hacer un poco más grande? <risa> Gracias. Universidad Autónoma de Chihuahua, Facultad de Filosofía y Letras, otorga la presente constancia al... Ahí serían otros nombres, pero 
entendemos el mensaje. Ok. Por su valiosa participación como panelista en la cuadra, no, en la Semana del Humanismo de Ética y Educación como Herramientas contra la Brecha Social, con la mesa panel Simón Well en perspectiva y velada a cabo de manera virtual el miércoles 6 de octubre del 2021 de Um, creo que... Ok, sí. Esa creo mera que... es. <ríe> ok. Constancia, licenciado José Luis Valde Chávez, por su valiosa participación como conferencista en la Semana del Humanismo de Ética, Educación y Educación como Herramienta contra la Brecha Social, con su conferencia The Importance of Educational Programs to Support Students in Social Risk, llevada a cabo de manera virtual el miércoles 6 de octubre del 2021, de 10 a 11. Okay. Y pues, Igual, Constancia, la disculpa que interrumpa Diana, para Axa y Rebeca, que también recibirán su constancia. Y esta constancia se las enviarán por correo como muestra de agradecimiento y es así como se finaliza este espacio en la cuadrogésimo tercera semana del humanismo. Para nuestros estudiantes y docentes, les recordamos seguir pendientes de las actividades del día. Continuamos con más participantes por parte de la Academia de Lengua Inglesa, la Mesa de Literatura Fantástica Mexicana, Vertientes y Posibilidades de Análisis. La presentación del libro Miradas de Género desde el Norte, tomos 1 y 2, la Mesa Panel Simón Will en Perspectiva, a cargo de la Academia de Filosofía, la Conferencia Consideraciones Éticas sobre la Desigualdad desde la Perspectiva del Cuerpo, concluyendo el día con la Conferencia Magistral a cargo del doctor Luis Alejandro Martínez Canales. No sé si tenga algo más que agregar. Agradecer a todos, a los asistentes y a los participantes. Y sigamos con nuestras clases o conferencias.